Oseo. Oseo. We're starting out with a Cherokee greeting. And the first piece I'm going to focus on, this is my drawing. And I have this piece that will accompany my drawing. Oh lady, the hem of whose garment is the sky, whose grace falls from her glance, who gives life from the touch of one finger. O oh, lady, whose hair is the willow, whose breath is the river song, who lopes through the Milky Way, vain at stars coming out. O oh, lady, whose sky head holds a thousand eyes, eyes even black of imploded nebulae, who trails frail as a virgin on the mist. O oh, lady, fling your bright drops to us, signs of your love, throw your green scarf on this earth again. O oh, smile, disrobe for us, unveil your eyes and we see. Okay. This is the way that I'm starting this particular celebration, starting, stemming from March, Women's History Month, all the way right up to now. Um, last night in particular, uh, KPBS featured um, a, pro a program called Rise Up, Songs of the Women's Movement, also celebrating the centennial of women's suffrage and the uh, Equal Rights Amendment and all that. And uh, music's a big part of this. They definitely said that you know music is what helps to carry the message across. And definitely uh, it featured people: Aretha Franklin, uh, Helen Reddy, Loretta Lynn, uh, Joan Jett, uh, Dolly Parton, Melissa Eldridge, Tina Turner, and a lot of other women singers. So. That's how it, we're starting this uh, celebration. It's, my piece is all about women in this way. And so the very first one I want to focus on is right here, this picture. This is Deb Holland. Not only is she the first woman, first Native American woman in this government post, she's also a woman of First Nation. The First Nation is the Pueblo Nation. And uh, on Friday, just two, two days ago, she was interviewed on KPBS by Judy Woodworth. Uh, the main subject was what has come to light is a very, very dark period in the history of the United States. And that was a government's idea of genocide. And clergy, um, had definitely harnessed themselves to the government's program of culture side and implemented uh, the destruction of Native American societies by removing, forcibly removing children from their parents and their community and subjecting them to assimilation schools, politely called boarding schools, where they were under uh, the power of menial-minded clerics. And thousands and thousands of Native American children were subject to this, and parents who got in the way of it were imprisoned. And many, many of these people, children, had died, including in Canada, where the whole Canadian nation is now in shock at the revelation of exhuming graves of children as young as three years old who have been victims of this horrible policy. Uh, St. Benedict's School in Minnesota is one that got publicized for saying uh, that they regret their complicity in the government's program of genocide. So that's really remarkable. <coughs> and. So the interview had to do with that since Deb Holland is definitely beginning an investigation into this matter. 
and along with that, um, this is you know very very important, very touching. Um, here is using the word tribe in Canada. The word uh, First Nations is used, but here they're still using tribe claims remains of nine who died at Pennsylvania Assimilation School. Hundreds and hundreds of children perished you know, in this situation. And to, um, for the first children being exhumed, exhumed and returned you know, to the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota is major. It's major that these people are the seeds, spores of our country. And there are going to be hundreds of them return to their homes. <clears throat> so, in this way, I'm definitely drawing attention to Deb Holland as woman, Native American woman, First Nations woman, and Secretary of the Interior of the United States government, whose government had implemented this horrible uh, episode that stayed in force until 1970. So that's what I have to say on that particular score. My main interest here with this subject is going to be a very famous poetess, Sappho. And if you can look here, Sappho. Uh, Sappho was born on an island on the Aegean, and it's called Lesbos. And you're going to know that, of course, the name lesbian has come from there, in Greek, lesbios, like that. And this is 2,600 years ago, and this island was off the coast of Asia Minor, exactly just south of Troy, if you've heard of that. <clears throat> and uh, she's very, very, very famous to have lived uh, notably for so long. And here in my portrait of her, I have this. And uh, in particular, I want to point out something along with her red lips. On her ear is an ear sleeve or ear cuff. Los Juristos, like that. And uh, you pin it over the ear and a amethyst crystal earring somehow is a fixture of this is very particular. Um, whether this was cosmetic, it maybe was, or that it actually had an auditory function, possibly. It ha that hasn't been recorded. And so we're looking at uh, a woman who practically is the arch lesbian, you know, in, in the way we're looking at this first read. And um, her hair is very close crop, curly hair, and she's wearing a kind of a hair piece, uh, a uh, what do you call it? a coil, a, a coil made of wool or woolly hair, is being fastened to her hair in a particular way. So keep focused on her, and I'll just kind of um, give you this first read of her. Sapo, often described as a woman who was short and dark with close cropped curly brown hair. Sappho the poet had remarkable stature, both in her time and ours, 2,600 years later. Her work was sung, taught, and quoted. Such lines as, love, that loosener of limbs, and more golden than gold, were spoken in Greek so often as to become cliches. Her poetry was as blood hot and immediate as a heartbeat. It gave her the nickname Burning Sappho. She gave life to a whole poetic and musical movement, creating a nurturing ambience for accomplished women from Greece and Asia Minor on her home <laughs> island of Lesbos. Sappho encouraged the creative careers of many celebrated women and spawned numerous Sappho's. Her protege, Damophila, also wrote and taught young women. 
In Sappho's day, a poet also meant to compose lyrics and melodies, singing, playing the lyre, and dancing. Sappho's writings evince her trust that the divine shares human delight in beauty and sensual pleasure. Sappho was a dedicated admirer of women and a writer of intimate human emotions. She was twice banished from Lesbos for her lesbian political views. Her love affairs with women to whom she was closest seemed to have been transitory. But like a blues singer, she took the personal pain in her life and transformed it into beauty. Sappho described her own songs as her immortal daughters. So, you come back to me. Uh, so, uh, not a, really a lot of her works have really survived that would be relatively complete. There are fragments and po uh, pieces, but her presence or her personality has endured fantastically. And, of course, uh, women who can uh, recognize themselves in this area of, of women, loving women, and so forth, can look to Sappho, you know, as a, a kind of a matron and that. Um, the name has come from the name of the island itself, and so, and so forth. <clears throat> and some of the things that are still continually to relate to her um, first, I want to point out this amphora. <clears throat> now, this amphora is a museum replica. It has a fixture on it that identifies it. So, that means that the museum, if we call it that, knows the original that's been replicated. And this was made in the, old, the second quarter of the fifth century somewhere between 425 and 450. And it's very significant because this was a short period of time in the mass pottery making of Greece of this particular kind of pottery. And that is, instead of being embellished with mythical themes, which was very, very predominant, um, this particular time shows something else. For one, the natural clay has been painted white, and on the white, the artist, the pottery artist, has drawn something. And in this case, there are three female figures here. And let me turn it this way. And you see this figure in red. This is Sappho. And it shows with her liar. I discovered this because on another base, another example of the same period, her name in Greek is written right alongside her. And I recognized that. So this undoubtedly is Sappho and holding the liar. So that is making this very remarkable. After this uh, period, we're we'll saying, well, up to 1850 or, I mean, 450 or so, uh, then the scenes became more funerary. So it was just this little space of time where the artist had this kind of freedom. And along with that, and, th and seeing this kind of inspired me to you know, go over here and look at the harp player. And because you know, she's dressed in red and, and so forth and playing the harp, the harp I'm taking it is a descendant of the lyre here. And so that's, I don't have a lyre to illustrate with. So this is an illustration of basically Sappho's with her lyre. That's the way I'm illustrating that. And uh, the island itself, Lesbos, is symbol. The symbol of the island itself is a lyre. And while we're over there, along with that, 
there's another character. Now, Sappho definitely was a living mortal woman. There is a mythical character, I think it's mythical, and that's Orphus. Now, Orphus and Eurydice are a theme that's very famous with many, many writers. And uh, Orphus, his home, is also Lesbos here. And the whole myth about him and Eurydice is, like I said, is, mo is very often told. But I'm emphasizing here with the music, uh, he was the master of the lyre. He's a master musician. He is the son of Apollo and Calliope, which were musical people. His mother definitely a musical genius, which he had inherited. But uh, so much so that he is just considered the master of music. And he was so masterful that he could practically raise the dead. And he almost did, but he got foiled. But basically, that's what goes into it. And what I'm illustrating here, um, there on that island has long been a sanctuary, the sanctuary of Orphus. And in that sanctuary, there is a head, and this head is considered an oracle, and that's why I have that over there. And the religion of Orphus has continued for a very long time, perhaps even till now. Uh, and it seems to me uh, Buddhists would not have any trouble in the Orphic religion. <laughs> it's very, very similar. So in the sanctuary, there was featured, you know, a head called the head of Orphus, and somehow it issued oracles. Now, along with that, if you can go right over here, this is a votive artifact from there. You know, ostensibly Orphus playing his lyre. So, um, the lyre has an animal head on top. Um, basically, Lesbos is in the house of Sagittarius, which is also the centurion, <clears throat> but it can also border into Capricorn, the goat. So possibly the head on his lyre, to me, could resemble a goat. But also very noteworthy, if you get a close-up of his head, the carving of his ear is a very naturalistic ear. However, the ear on the other side is evidently a ear cup. <laughs> it definitely is a cup, almost looks like a resonator, and it is very much alongside of that part of his instrument. So, very, very much so, this is a votive offering or artifact from that ancient site of Orphus on Lesbos. Other things that I have here. I wanted to point out up here, right above it, uh, this archaic rendering I have of three women, women dancing, because this theme with uh, Sappho is certainly about music and dancing, very, very much so. And along with this um, theme uh, last night of Rise Up, you know, women through music, I want to show women in multiples, <clears throat> women together. That's my main reason of showing this here, called women dancing, dancing together. The nature of, you know, the artifacts and things I have are going to be singular. So in this case, I wanted to show women together. And very much the uh, KPBS program last night was all about women together, coming together, being free to come together. And along with that, the other images I have up above that is my rendering of the virgin daughter of Hera, Ebe, and she has on her head uh, the wreath of wild lettuce. And it was through the herbalist that um, Hera somehow partook of the wild lettuce that caused her pregnancy. Uh, so it can basically say her daughter is born through the conjunction of the Virgin Mother with wild lettuce. And above that is my rendering of the moon of Serene, or Helen, in the moon. And we can come over here, 
And this is a picture of a girl, a Greek girl, dancing along with this theme. And then we can come down here to this one. In this one, I have rendered a Sanskrit letter for Ma. And Ma, of course, is the Ma of everything. And then you can come here to this item here. Um, this was featured on our CD. This is the Celtic Ensemble, Changing Moon, and I made this replica of an ancient, very ancient Celtic artifact of a comb to show the comb was very much one of her symbols, the symbol of woman and goddess. So that's what the artifact is there, since all my theme here is for woman. And you got that. Also, we can look here at this little figure. This little figure is from India, and this would be Yoni Rutama. Yoni Rutama means the solar system in miniature. And since she is the Yoni Rutama, she is also the source of everything. You can definitely render that. And over here on the other side, I have a column with wings surmounting it. Um, the column is a symbol of Hera. Hera is the mother of all women. The column, her symbol, also is a symbol for tree. She's also the tree. Our word true or truth comes from tree because it means firm, the firm. So it's necessary to have that for her. We go down here. Here, this very recognizable icon that has stand as the emblem of the woman's island of Crete and figures, three-dimensional figures and so forth, of a woman holding serpents is definitely the sign of woman in those ancient days of Greece. And in front of her, her all giving hands there, I have put, you know, uh, she holds the whole world in her hands with these tiny figures from Pyramid Lake uh, in Nevada. Now I want to go over here to this image. Now what I'm rendering here, I have actually created this for the Japanese myth, the Japanese myth of Amaterasu. And just briefly, you know, what I've rendered here is the cavity or the crevice or the crease. And we say Kuhara. Kuhara is that cavity. And the goddess or woman of that cavity is Kuhari. Kuhari. <laughs> and so in the story, in the myth, is that Amaterasu, kind of rendered as earth woman or earth goddess, has fallen back deliberately into this crease in the rock and has pulled it around her so as to swallow herself into the rock. And in doing this, the whole world was plunged into darkness and woe, as it's called, like that. So all the kami, spirits and so forth, did everything to try and bring her out like that. It stayed, it stayed that way. They had tried all kinds of devices. But it wasn't until this famous singer that was on the program last night, uh, Joni, Joni Jack, yeah. Joni Jett. Joni Jett did her rendition of uh, Bad Reputation. Yeah, that was the key. Uh, as she displayed herself in her performance of Bad Reputation, that really got her. And so then she began to op open out this rock <laughs> like that and begin to emerge. And as she did so, 
someone held a mirror up so that she did see and could see herself coming out. Well, this whole thing is exactly the whole uh, process of woman's transformation. It's actually called Satipati, and that means the descent of the goddess into the woman, where she changes from her empirical personality toward the goddess to herself, towards her sovereignty of herself. So here she sees herself coming out, and it becomes sort of the byword in the pre-Buddhist myth in that culture here. And for that, I have a Mary Oliver poem. And we'll start right down at the bottom with this figure because the title of Mary's poem is Grass. So I'm going to now read her poem. Those who disappointed, betrayed, scarified, those who would still put their hands upon me, those who belong to the past. How many of us have waited the years with groaning and weeping? How many years have I done it? How many nights spent panting, hating, grieving? O oh, merciless, pitiless remembrances! I walk over the green hillsides, I lie down on the harsh, sun-flavored blades and bundles of grass. The grass cares nothing about me. It doesn't want anything from me. It rises to its own purpose. And sweetly, following the single holy dictum to be itself, to let the sky be the sky, to let a young girl be a young girl freely, to let a middle-aged woman be, comfortably, a middle-aged woman. Those bloody sharps and flats, those endless calamities of the personal past. Bah! I disown them from the rest of my life, in which I mean to rest. This is, I think, what holiness is. The natural world will, well, where every moment is full of the passion to keep moving. Inside every woman there is her cave full of light, full of snow, full of concentration. I have knelt there, and so have you, hanging on to what you love, to what is lovely. But the words are in place. And the fish leaps like a black pin, and leaps again when starlight strikes from the black plush of the poem, that breathless space.